All right, well, thank you everyone for your patience. Um, we have a number of folks joining us in the audience um, just as of now. Um, so if you'll please allow me to reread our land acknowledgement. Uh, the land we are meeting on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Thank you and welcome again to our special lecture. There will be an opportunity to take questions at the end of the talk today, so please feel free to send those through the chat icon. Again, that's in the bottom middle of your screen. I will now turn it over to the chair of the foundation, Lynn Carrillo. Hello, everyone, and welcome, warmly welcoming you. Uh, and thank you for joining us as we commemorate the 175th anniversary of the Irish famine migration to Toronto. We're delighted to have Professor Mark Gowan on hand to explain the impact of this historic event. In his book, Death or Canada, the Irish Famine Migration to Toronto, 1847. He described the arrival and told stories of the men and women who made that perilous voyage across the sea to Canada. Professor McGowan is renowned for his work on the Catholic Church in Canada and the Great Irish Famine, as well as the lasting impact of the mass Irish famine migration here in Canada. Dr. McGowan is a professor of history and Celtic studies and the interim principal of the University of St. Michael's College. His students rate his seminars as lively and enjoyable from start to finish and confirm that he is an overall great guy. Welcome, Mark. Thanks very much, Lynn. <laughs> the hidden, hidden information always uh, amuses me. Um, and I'm actually in Ireland right now. So uh, it's uh, 1131 uh, in Maynooth, uh, and I'm currently a visiting research fellow uh, and uh, will return to Canada after a few weeks here at Maynooth University, which is in uh, County Kildare outside of Dublin. Uh, but they have a, a terrific uh, history department and uh, a very rich archive that I've been that I've been working in. And you can actually say tonight that McGowan started talking in May and uh, ended up uh, finishing his talk in June. So uh, uh, it's it's just one of those uh, quirks of the uh, the five hour time difference. So I'm going to share my screen with you if I can here and. Uh, It'll give uh, give you something to look at as uh, as I talk to you about a rather important event in Toronto's history that certainly has has become more to the fore uh, in the last few years. And uh, I'd like to thank Lynn for giving me the opportunity to talk about um, this particular event in Toronto's history. And I'd like to thank Mariah for 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 doing all of the technical work that she's doing uh, in, in terms of. Of, of what we might have thought three years ago was impossible that you were being given uh, a live lecture uh, from another continent in a different time zone. Uh, yeah, the things, I think we look at this pandemic in many ways, but uh, certainly one of the, the positives that has come out of it is the way in which we've enhanced our ability to communicate uh, in, in very difficult and challenging times. So um, uh, tonight, what I would like to do uh, is uh, over the next 40 minutes or so is just give you an overview of, first of all, um, some of the rudiments of, uh, of this migration, because it's always important to take a look at um, a migration as being, uh, in a sense, both uh, having a starting point and a finishing point uh, and uh, and making sure that we see the whole transatlantic perspective of this so that when people land 
uh, at Reese's Wharf in Toronto in 1847, uh, that there is a, a long history uh, that, uh, that precedes them uh, coming to here. So let's take you to Ireland first, uh, which is of course, uh, where uh, the, the blight and then the famine took place. Um, this is County Kerry. This is McGillicuddy's Reeks. These are the highest peaks uh, in all of Ireland in the southwest corner uh, of the island. Um, this is actually Ladies' View, uh, which was named after um, Queen Victoria's ladies-in-waiting who just particularly stopped when the carriage went by. Loved this view, and to this day, it's Ladies' View. Uh, but it gives you a sense of the uh, of the verdure uh, of the island. Um, there's a certain richness, uh, both uh, uh, in terms of its greenery and its agricultural life, uh, and all of that uh, came into question uh, in 1847. Now, most of the people in Ireland didn't live in the quaint cottages that that uh, sort of typify. Uh, a, a, how should we say, a folk park in Ireland today or in some of the romantic uh, art. Um, actually, I took this, this uh, photograph not, not a week ago in Omagh in County Tyrone uh, in the north of Ireland. Um, it's supposed to be a, a fourth class cottage. And this is where most uh, of the farming class, the cottiers and the laborers would have lived in the 1840s, minus the glass window that I pointed out to the, to the curator of the park who was with me. And he apologized, but he said that uh, uh, when they reconstructed this, this, this house, it, it came with uh, uh, a glass window. So most uh, Irish uh, working class, farm class, laborers, cottiers, uh, would have lived in a structure of one room. Um, this one happens to be of stone. There were stone cottages, um, but uh, in a sense, uh, most of them were mud and don't survive today. So uh, the only way that you can, you can relay uh, this, this kind of lifestyle to contemporaries is to, is to reconstruct stone uh, uh, stone cabins. So most Irish in this time period would have lived in a one room cabin uh, that uh, was was considered fourth class. Now this would be a third class cabin, a little bit different. Uh, here we have multiple windows, we do have glass, we usually have two rooms, sometimes a loft uh, made of stone with uh, with a lime covering, two rooms uh, and two fireplaces. And this actually happens to be a reconstruction of uh, the house that uh, Bishop Hughes of New York in the mid 19th century was born uh, in County Tyrone. Um, but this would be a fairly typical looking third class house, usually of a middling farmer, uh, someone who is better off than those who, who paid uh, for uh, you know, limited term leases on the large estates of Ireland. So just to give you a sense of, of what life was like from below, uh, as opposed to the big houses, which are, are typically uh, focused upon during this, this pre-famine and famine period. So the first potato blight uh, of, of this this series of events in the 1840s took place in 1845. But interestingly enough, many people don't know that the blight had already uh, taken place in places like Ontario or Upper Canada, uh, Lower Canada or Quebec and Nova Scotia. In fact, there was a potato blight in Nova Scotia in the early 1840s and its North American blight is actually credited with traveling on board ships uh, full of cargo to places like Ireland and Europe. Um, and it's important to note uh, that uh, this blight uh, didn't have the devastating effect uh, in, in Canada, as we would now call it today, uh, because of the diversification of crops. And that is, for example, where it hit hardest in the province of Nova Scotia, um, there still was a diversity of, uh, of, of crops oats, wheat, and others, so that the dependence on the potato wasn't as strong as it was in Ireland. Because you think of Ireland at the same time, here you have large landed estates, over 2,000 of them across the island, and you can see the map here. And in those estates, uh, the tenants began to 
you know, subdivide their properties among their children. And the smaller the pieces of land get, the less you can actually produce on the land. And this sort of marvel of the potato uh, was, was easily grown uh, it, and it grew in abundance. And in fact, in the early 19th century, it was said that the average Irish male in the rural areas ate about 14 pounds of potatoes a day. And if you've ever grown potatoes, and I do in my, uh, in my, my home in Whitby outside, um, you know, you get this marvelous harvest. And so you think of people owning or not, or renting one to three acres and the kind of yield they would get on the potato is, is marvelous and, and certainly uh, an enriched uh, diet in some ways. Um, but in 1845, uh, that dependence uh, became a liability. Uh, the blight hit Ireland uh, in at least 17 counties. And that's why really the famine doesn't begin in 1845. Um, the famine itself is later, but the blight begins in 1845. Affects about 17 out of the 32 counties of Ireland. And if I can use my cursor here, you can see my arrow. And mostly in the South and in the West country uh, in 1845. And many Irish farmers felt we've seen this before. We've had periodic crop failures of the potato even in this century. And so many were quite prepared to, in a sense, see it through knowing full well that in the past uh, the, the, the blight was temporary and uh, would, uh, uh, would be succeeded by an excellent crop uh, the following year. Um, that wasn't the case because in 1846, the blight continued uh, to inflict uh, Ireland and now not such 17 counties, but all 32 counties of Ireland were affected by this. And that meant the absolute devastation of the potato crop, which for many Irish was the crop upon which they depended. And it forced the British government of Sir Robert Peel uh, to, uh, in a sense, cancel uh, the corn laws, which protected uh, the UK agriculture and allow for the importation of, uh, of, of grain and mostly American maize. Uh, and I don't want to use the word corn. We would use the word corn, but in the UK at the time, the word corn meant wheat. But this would be American maize, uh, or what we would call corn on the cob, that was imported uh, at a penny a pound uh, for those who wish to buy it. And in some estates was distributed free. Um, the problem here was not that the government of Sir Robert Peel uh, was, was doing a bad thing. In fact, I mean, those who were uh, opposed to free trade thought it was a bad thing. But in this particular case, they were trying to supply the cheapest food possible that was available on the market at the time for those who were in desperate need of food uh, in 1846. Um, the problem was is that most Irish uh, in those classes had no experience with maize. Um, they didn't know how to prepare it properly. Um, uh, if you can think of um, the coarse kernels of, uh, of corn that we, we, we put up for display in the autumn or even popcorn kernels, um, those would have to be ground and then made into paste or to bread. The Irish had absolutely no experience with this. And actually, the, the, the maize itself proved to be a liability as it was very hard on their digestive system, often caused internal bleeding. And so what effectively had seen to be a solution in the short term uh, to this problem proved to be uh, uh, a much more difficult uh, situation for the Irish in terms of feeding themselves. Um, many were forced to leave. And of course, over the, over the, the years of the famine uh, from 1846 uh, through to 1851-52, uh, um, many Irish had to leave. And it's estimated that in a population of about 8 million at the beginning of the famine, uh, about 1 million people died. 
uh, by 1861, and about another million and a half left the country. These are cabins uh, that were abandoned during the famine on the Fanad Peninsula in County Donegal. And it's interesting when you're a researcher working on the famine and you go from county to county, and I can actually say now I've been in all 32 counties uh, doing this work. Um, I was having lunch and a local in, in Donegal said, oh, I know where a famine village is. And he insisted that I see it right there and then, didn't even finish the lunch, drove me out here. And I was able to photograph uh, some of these cabins. So people left uh, and uh, some were assisted to leave. Um, this is a, a, a map of the new National Famine Way in Ireland, and you can see at the extreme left of your screen uh, the manor house of uh, Major Dennis Mann in County Roscommon, so almost the center of Ireland. Uh, and uh, these tenants were assisted by Dennis Mann. Uh, their passage was paid, extra provisions were provided, provided they toppled their cabins uh, and left the country. Uh, on four ships uh, that were destined to go uh, to uh, Quebec uh, in Canada. So these were assisted migrants, and this is they traveled on foot along the Royal Canal for uh, 160 kilometers. And uh, I know the extent of this uh, only because uh, I actually walked this distance along the Royal Canal. Here we have a, a scene of the Royal Canal uh, in. Uh, just before the pandemic in 2019. Uh, it's now called the National Famine Way. It didn't look as nice as this, uh, we think in 1847 when Dennis Mann assisted 1,490 of his tenants off the estate. Um, but they, uh, like many, uh, ended up in the port of Dublin and then crossed over to Liverpool uh, where uh, many ships filled with Irish left for British North American ports, uh, mostly uh, the port of Quebec, some to St. John, New Brunswick, uh, and uh, two ports in the United States. So what we have during the famine is the poorest of the poor really die where they were in Ireland. Those who could afford a little bit of travel money uh, sold what they had and ended up in other parts of the United Kingdom, particularly uh, England and Scotland. And to this day, of course, you have the descendants of communities of Irish living in Glasgow, uh, in Manchester, in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, in London, and of course, the largest Irish city outside of Ireland is Liverpool. So, um, those who could afford a little bit more uh, were uh, accorded transatlantic passage. And interestingly enough, even though I use Dennis Mann's estate as an example, because I've been working on it, only about 8% uh, in 1847 of those Irish migrants who came to British North America uh, actually were assisted. Most uh, came, uh, in a sense, uh, on their own pound. Um, but they came on refitted ships. Uh, this is kind of the top sails of the Jeannie Johnson, which was the ship built in Quebec. And this was a replica built in Blennerville uh, in, uh, in uh, County, uh, County Limerick, uh, sorry, County Kerry, uh, for the commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the famine. It sits right now on the Liver River Liffey in, in Dublin. Um, and uh, unlike other ships, no lives were lost aboard this, but it just it was a refitted ship. It was not really designed for passengers. It was designed for cargo. And so uh, all sorts of raw materials were transported from North America to the United Kingdom and in, in part to Ireland. Um, all of those pieces of cargo, whether it be timber or grain or what have you, were unloaded in port. And normally in a regular sailing season, stones were added to the ship as ballast to make the return trip across the Atlantic. Now the ballast in 1846, 1847, right through to the 1850s, the ballast was people. And so aboard these ships that were not designed for passenger ships, you have crowded uh, these folks who have left their estates, either assisted or not assisted, who are potentially diseased, who are certainly hungry, uh, and they are crowded aboard these ships, and, and they cross the North Atlantic. So this is, um, this is an added burden to what they've already experienced in Ireland. 
Um, so just to give you a sense, th there's, a, there's a myth out there that somehow the United States was not accepting uh, uh, migrants in this year. But as you can see from the work that I've done in terms of uh, the, the actual flow of migrants during the famine, you can see that um, British North America, which constitutes Canada, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland, um, they we actually hit our peak of Irish migration in 1847. And if you look at the American st statistic right beside it, um, they were still accepting migrants, but the key here is, is that they were much more perspicacious. They were much more uh, scrutinizing the kind of migrant that got off the ship. And the fines were heavy if someone was diseased getting off a ship in New York, uh, in Philadelphia, in Boston, uh, or in New Orleans, which was another major uh, port of entry to the United States for, for migrants. But what you can see here is a, a great shift. In 1847, the, the numbers coming to British North America and the United States are fairly close. And then it precipitously drops in British North America and look how it grows within the United States. And so one of the great myths in Canada uh, is that somehow the Irish came during the famine. They actually didn't. Uh, 450,000 Irish came prior to the famine. The year 1847 really marks the high watermark of Irish migration to this country. Whereas in the United States, what we see is a shift where it was going down in Canada, it was actually going up in the United States. And this will um, play out uh, in, in the Irish communities developing in the United States in a very different way from what they develop uh, in Canada. But that's a subject of another lecture, but I just thought of give you a, a, a bit of a teaser uh, on that. So as I said before, the fares were cheaper to British North America, uh, about three pounds, 10 shillings on average. They were five pounds to, to the United States. And of course there was a head tax that I've just mentioned uh, and heavy fines. So many of the ships who, you know, midway through the Atlantic would even change course uh, to, uh, if they noticed that people on board uh, were, were, were diseased, knowing full well that if they landed them in a place like New York or Boston, uh, they would be fined. But that was not the case uh, if they landed in St. John, New Brunswick, particularly, or Quebec. And interestingly enough, there are not many famine migrants who land in Nova Scotia because of the famine that had been taking place there. And the, and the governor of Nova Scotia informed the colonial office in Britain that there was nothing there for them except more misery. And so much of the famine migration, about 17,000 go to New Brunswick uh, in 1847, uh, and about 90,000 uh, go uh, to uh, Quebec. So there we have it, about 109,000 migrants to British North America. And here you have a fairly stereotypical patty looking uh, uh, caricature of uh, the potential migrant uh, uh, going uh, in that year. Uh, many ships advertised. Uh, and so uh, Irish who wanted to leave on their own accord uh, often left through ports like Cork, uh, Limerick was the, the port that sent the most number of ships uh, to Canada. And actually, if you, if you boarded a ship in Limerick, there was a much better chance of you surviving that voyage uh, because of the, the scrutiny that was given by the port's captain there, making sure that people who boarded ships in Limerick uh, weren't diseased. That was not the case in Liverpool, where some of the most notorious so-called coffin ships left, and also the Port of Cork. But there were ships leaving from Sligo in, in, the, in the west of Ireland, from, from Derry or London Derry, whichever you prefer, uh, in the north of Ireland, uh, from Belfast and from Newry as well. But the most uh, Irish traveled through the Port of Liverpool. Um, and the interesting thing is that, that Canada was not necessarily a favored port. Uh, when doing some research in Limerick uh, some time ago, in the Limerick Reporter, uh, one commentator said, quote, in the present day, there is a refinement of the edict of the protector, and that was Oliver Cromwell, to hell or Connacht. Um, and the word today is death or Canada. And that was the, uh, the quotation that inspired me to 
call my book on the famine, Death or Canada. This is actually uh, part of a, a larger sculpture by John Bayan at the National Famine Monument at the foot of Crow Patrick in County Mayo. Uh, and it's a, a ship uh, which is basically formed out of skeletons uh, uh, across the bronze, a really moving uh, and impressive sculpture. Once they crossed the Atlantic, it took about six to seven weeks, depending uh, on uh, where you sailed from and depending on the currents, because remember the prevailing current, the, the Gulf Stream is pushing against you, as are the trade winds. And so you're tacking uh, uh, all the time. Um, the Atlantic is rough in the spring when most of them uh, would have migrated and uh, their first port of entry in the St. Lawrence River would have been this in Gorosil. And I was privileged actually in 2019 with members of the Irish Heritage Trust. We were flown in on an off day uh, to Gorosil. And so we got some aerial photographs of the island. Uh, Gorosil is about 40 kilometers northeast of Quebec City in the St. Lawrence River. It was first used as a quarantine island in 1832 uh, when the cholera epidemic had, uh, had broken out. Uh, and it was in continuous use for migrants until the early 20th century. And then um, Agriculture Canada took it over for uh, its own uses in the 1930s. But it has now been returned since the 1990s as a, uh, uh, a national historic site. Uh, for, for migrants and particularly for the Irish. Now, when the Irish landed here, this was a quarantine station. Uh, it, it was rough, but the ships initially uh, had to be emptied of their passengers. They had to be inspected uh, for, for illness because many uh, were suffering from, uh, uh, well, how should we say, uh, typhus, which was a, uh, a sh they called ship's fever. Uh, which was a, a bacterial infection, uh, and one infected yourself with typhus. So um, a louse uh, would, would land on you, uh, would bite you, and then defecate into the bite. Uh, and naturally, much like a mosquito bite, you would scratch it and you infected yourself. Um, the incubation period of typhus was anywhere between 10 to 14 days. So many people who had typhus didn't know they had it until they began to show symptoms of rashes, um, uh, pains uh, in, their, in their abdomen, um, called typhus because you, of a bogginess that you get. I think in our current COVID situation, I think we can understand this much better given the fact that um, you seem asymptomatic for a while, then you show symptoms of, in this case, a virus, uh, and uh, you've already infected other people, whether you knew it or not. Typhus is highly infectious. So people were landed at Grosil, uh, and uh, this is a cross erected to commemorate uh, the some five to 6,000 Irish who died on that island of typhus and were buried there. Uh, in 1847. This is a, a, an artist's conception of what it might have look, looked like at the time, landing at Grosil, uh, the Irish passengers being herded off, uh, and then ending up in these lazarettos if they were sick. Now, this is a re, the, the building itself is, is authentic to the period. And if you visit the island, which you can do uh, during the summer months, um, you can actually visit the original lazarettos that were erected on the island. And of course, this is a kind of bunk, but the problem was is that the sick were, 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 were in a sense lying with the, with, with the healthy, which just meant that the infection spread. And as I said, typhus was, was highly uh, infectious. Um, uh, you could uh, contract it off surfaces um, as you know, the body was shedding. This is more likely what, uh, this is one of the original lazarettos built in the 1840s um, and still uh, there today. Um, here is a, a scene of the cemetery. Um, many of the Irish who left in 1847 never saw any part of Canada other than this island. And this is where their journey ended. So they're close in that burial ground, close to five to 6,000 people, we're not sure. If you landed in Quebec and then moved on down the St. Lawrence River uh, or up the St. Lawrence River rather to Montreal, um, more fever sheds were erected because of people contracting typhus, not knowing it and others contracting it along the way. 
uh, from those who appeared to be asymptomatic. And so uh, fever sheds were erected in Montreal uh, at Point Saint-Charles. Uh, and uh, when workers were excavating for the Victoria Bridge in the 1850s, um, they found uh, just piles of human remains where they were building the bridge. And so they dredged this stone out of the river and created this monument there. So it's not just Grosil where, 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 where the Irish migrants die, they die all along their route into the interior. And so we have the Irish landing, and I'll use my arrow again, of course, in St. John, New Brunswick, many of them moving on to the United States. We have just seen Grosil, which would be around here, Quebec City, down to Montreal, and then into uh, upper Canada. And as you can see by this map, which I always like using this map because it shows that the upper Canada or the Ontario that they were entering uh, as they moved down the St. Lawrence River um, already had much of the best land settled as you can see this settlement line in the 1830s. So those who intended to sort of continue farming uh, as they had known in Ireland uh, would would be forced into these back areas or work as, uh, as laborers in these previous settled areas, which had some of the best agricultural land in the province. Um, and this gives you another view of, uh, of some of the major centers where many of these Irish uh, would have been found. But our focus this evening is Toronto. Um, uh, by the way, that's uh, an early picture of what we have now called Danforth Avenue or the Kingston Road. So um, the roads are primitive. Um, some have been macadamized, but Muddy York got its name uh, for, for good reason uh, in this period. Um, this is a rather romantic view of when they entered uh, Toronto Harbor. So about 38,000 migrants uh, land uh, in Toronto in 1847. And this is a town that only has a population of roughly 20,000. So just imagine it on today's scale when the Metro Toronto area has five to 6 million people and twice that many land within a four month period. What do you do with them? And we've had refugee situations in our recent history that have been serious, but imagine back to 1847 when every day hundreds of migrants are landing uh, in Toronto Harbor and many of them are sick and have to be triaged and either moved to hospital facilities that have been hastily uh, arranged or, or moved on. Um, so I always love this shot because it's uh, one of the earliest graphics of Toronto Harbor. And of course, as many of my students would say, well, I thought we had islands out there. Well, actually, originally until the 1850s, we had a one large peninsula. It was a beautiful natural harbor. Uh, but in a storm in the 1850s, um, the, the western uh, neck here or isthmus uh, was uh, flooded over and uh, the islands were born. Uh, but uh, it was a beautiful natural harbor where uh, many of the Irish landed in 1847, and they would have landed close to the western end of the harbor. Sorry, that was the east where the, uh, uh, the isthmus was. Um, I'm sorry, it's past midnight here. So uh, the, they would have landed here at the foot of John Street, where uh, at this point you would have the, um, uh, the uh, convention center. Uh, front, front Street, uh, and they would have had been triaged at the harbor uh, by the emigration agent who was Edward McElderry, uh, an appointee of the city uh, who represented uh, uh, the emigration agency uh, in the province, uh, headed by uh, Anthony Hawk, who was headquartered in Kingston. And what McElderry would do is he would, he would triage the healthy uh, and send them on their way. And we actually have a collection of vouchers that have been studied by one of my former students, Dr. Laura Smith, um, as to how um, at, the, at the expense of the government, migrants were moved out of the city if they were healthy very quickly. And they moved on to Hamilton, Brantford, Niagara, uh, and, uh, and points west 
uh, or north uh, to the Holland Marsh area in the hope that they would get agricultural work there. The sick uh, were taken by cart uh, to this area here, and you can see a building on an angle, and that would be the Toronto General Hospital at the time, which became the Toronto Emigrant Hospital uh, in 1847. Uh, and that was McElderry's job. Um, and unfortunately, McElderry died in November of 1847 uh, of complications and disease likely incurred uh, as he was doing that job uh, at Reese's Wharf. Um, this is a view of Toronto just before the fire in the late 1840s. It's, sometimes you see Meritori giving interviews in front of this, but it's one of my favorite shots just to give you a sense of how big Toronto Harbor was. This is Front Street today. Most of this land today has been reclaimed for things like uh, um, the Sky Dome and uh, various, <laughs> various other venues. But uh, in 1847, uh, this would be the harbor that, that greeted. Uh, and I've got my arrow way here to the west, and that was where they would be landed very close today uh, to uh, what is called Aaron's Key, where the Famine Memorial stands. Um, so here's the, uh, a little bit of a tally. Um, in the research that we've done in the preparation for the creation of Ireland Park in 2007, we discovered that um, about 80% of the, of the 38,000 migrants uh, who were Irish were Catholic, but we also found 20% who were Protestant. And in fact, um, because of this um, surprising statistic, um, Toronto now has in St. James Cemetery um, the, one of the few monuments to Protestant famine migrants uh, in the world. Um, and that's because St. James Cemetery kept excellent records. And uh, we then recognized that uh, those who weren't Catholic were buried there. Um, the Catholic cemetery records are rough for this period because Bishop Michael Power was tending to the sheds. He was, he was rather fastidious about the keeping of records, but most of his priests were sick and, uh, and the burials sometimes went unrecorded or if they were recorded, those documents have been lost. So if you actually go to the Ireland Park Memorial on Aaron's Key today, and there are well over 660 names on that memorial, there's a disproportionate number of Protestant names on that memorial because we actually have records of of the Protestants that are, are far more complete than the records for um, the Catholic dead. Uh, but it does give you a sense that this wasn't, uh, the famine migrants were not exclusively Catholic. And in fact, in Ireland today, there is still a myth in the North of Ireland that this was a Southern problem and a Catholic problem. And there have been several scholars who have teased out the evidence to show that in fact, that this affected um, the, the counties of Ulster, as well as uh, the counties of the other three provinces in Ireland. So um, of course the, the research is always exciting when you're myth busting uh, and, uh, and this certainly has been for Toronto. Um, this is actually just some extras from the movie Death or Canada that was uh, uh, based on our research in, in 2009. Maybe some of you had, had seen it, um, but it just helps give us a, a visual uh, because we have no visuals from the period uh, because of the, the lack of commercial photography in the 1840s. Uh, and this is kind of a cheesy plug. Uh, my eldest daughter actually was one of the, the extras in the film in 2009, but she does give that kind of, uh, uh, how should we say, that uh, pathetic look. Uh, she wouldn't appreciate me saying that. Um, one of the, the main figures in Toronto in the reception of the immigrants was uh, Bishop Michael Power. Um, he was the first Catholic Bishop of Toronto. He was actually a Nova Scotian Irish, um, and he was in his early 40s. He was uh, um, very active uh, in Ireland in recruiting uh, this woman and her cohort, the Loretto sisters from Rathfarnham outside of, uh, uh, of Dublin. Uh, this is Teresa Dees. And they actually arrive in September of 1847, uh, supposedly to set up a school. Uh, and they realize that they've arrived at the other end of the famine. Michael Power may have been one of the few Torontonians to be, see both sides of it. He was in Ireland to witness the famine. 
He warned Torontonians. He came back um, and advocated for um, the how shall we say the the selfless treatment uh, of migrants who arrived uh, and the sisters arrived and it's interesting in their records they describe how how worried power was uh, about them contracting typhus and about his priests contracting typhus and in fact uh, a week ago I was in the archives here in Ireland and I found a letter that I had no idea existed where he was writing uh, to All Hallows Seminary in Dublin uh, to ask them for more priests because he feared that in the midst of this typhus epidemic in Toronto, um, he was going to lose priests and would have to, uh, in a sense, replace them. And he was begging uh, for, uh, for new priests. And that was only about two months before he died because Michael Power uh, contracted typhus while administering to uh, the Irish in the fever sheds and he died on October 1st. Uh, 1847, uh, very, very, just about a week shy of his 43rd birthday. Um, one of the unsung heroes uh, of the Irish famine in terms of first responders. Another scene from the movie, uh, just to give you a sense of, of those migrants coming in. Um, this is a, a graphic of the, of the hospital, the emigrant hospital that stood at King and John Street. And of course, if you know King and John Street now, it's uh, the headquarters of the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, but prior to the building of the, the current TIFF, um, uh, the archaeologists uh, put spades in the ground at King and John and actually discovered uh, the foundations of this building. And I include a quotation here because the Toronto Mirror, which was an Irish Catholic paper, said, you know, are the charities of our holy religion dried up? Are the bowls of our compassion closed against the cries of our people? Look at the squalor and the haggard aspect of these poor creatures. Look at their fleshless bodies and their bloodless faces, at their despair and their mental torpor. And what the mirror is responding to is the fact that the Torontonians stand back in horror of what's happening, and many of them flee the city. Uh, a bishop power, um, uh, Archdeacon Grasset, who was an Anglican at the, at the Anglican Cathedral, um, uh, religious figures are, are asking people to stop fleeing the city and in the spirit of Christian charity, help these people uh, as, as, they, as they try to recover from their illness, look for work uh, and become uh, members uh, of, of their society. But this is the general hospital uh, where uh, a good portion of the Irish migrants who are infected with typhus or um, other diseases uh, end up. Um, there is not enough room in the hospital. And what happens is, is that uh, fever sheds are constructed. This is actually a scene uh, uh, from, the, from the movie that was made in 2009. It was filmed at Black Creek Pioneer Village. And these are, are um, our equipment sheds that they they the filmmakers reconverted into uh, into fever sheds. Sixteen sheds were constructed at the general hospital. Um, about eleven hundred and twenty four people died uh, in those sheds, um, including the uh, chief physician in July of eighteen forty seven, George Grisset, who was the brother of the archdeacon of the Anglican. Cathedral. Susan Bailey, we don't know almost anything about her other than she was a nurse. She was the head nurse in the fever sheds. She died. And as I said before, Edward McElderry, uh, the emigration agent, also died. No numerous Torontonians who had sacrificed. This is in the film, they CGI'd what these sheds might have looked like. And you have uh, a sense of what the Stone Hospital. Uh, look like, and, uh, and then you have uh, the 16 sheds. Uh, and I included this because we have no graphic representations uh, from this period of any of the, the main characters uh, who were first responders in Toronto that I just mentioned. So here is a, uh, an actor playing uh, um, uh, Bishop Power, who is, is giving the, uh, 
uh, his blessing and last rites to uh, this uh, dying patient, uh, an actor representing George Brissett and an actor uh, representing um, uh, Susan Bailey. Now, those of you who are, are Irish uh, in, in, in the city may recognize this character. This was the grand dame of the Irish community, um, uh, Peggy, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm having a seniors moment. Um, uh, she was, uh, she was uh, an Irish speaker and uh, was uh, recruited to be an extra uh, in the film. Uh, and uh, this was a depiction of the sheds itself. Um, finally, the butcher's bill in Toronto of the 38,560 migrants who landed in the city, 1,124 were dead. Um, and uh, this is a sculpture uh, that was created uh, through the Ireland Park Foundation, now the Canada Ireland Foundation, uh, to commemorate those who landed uh, in Toronto in 1847. Um, Rowan Gillespie had cast uh, the, the sculptures at, Dub at Customs House Key in Dublin as the departure, and he cast figures here in Toronto as the arrival. And the real irony here is you have the empty towers, <laughs> no grain in them, of the Canada Malting Company and a famine commemoration uh, right below it. And so we have the figures uh, fewer figures here to represent those who died uh, along uh, the way from Ireland than those at Customs House Key. Um, the hat is now missing because uh, Rowan Gillespie recast, he didn't like the figure with the hat on it. Um, you have uh, a figure of a woman dying here uh, in the middle and actually Rowan Gillespie cast that uh, based on he sitting with his mother as she passed away. And so um, it had great meaning for him, uh, both as a, as a sculptor and as a son uh, to, to depict uh, a woman in uh, the last, uh, giving her last breaths of life. Um, this uh, is uh, uh, Kilkenny limestone that was imported uh, from Ireland. It's, uh, it seems to be, if you look back, it looks like a ship almost uh, as you, uh, uh, you look at it from a distance, but within each of these crevices are carved the names of as many people as we could have found um, that died uh, in Toronto in 1847. Um, and this is a, one of the figures, the, uh, uh, the statue of the, of the uncertain boy who faces uh, an uncertain future. And what's interesting is there were at least 197 orphans uh, who were left in Toronto. Um, the municipality created a widow's and orphan's home and it was members of the clergy and members of the, the committee running the home that placed these children within homes in the Toronto area and beyond, making sure in a very ecumenical gesture, actually, um, Catholic priests making sure that Catholic children were placed in Catholic homes uh, and Protestant supervisors of the orphans' homes making sure that Protestant children were placed uh, in appropriate Protestant homes. Um, and although in other places in Canada, there were, there were close to uh, 1,500 other orphans, um, in Toronto, because of the special powers that the municipality had uh, under the provincial government at the time, um, they actually created uh, contracts of indenture uh, with prospective hosts for these orphan children. So we still have these, and we find that Farmers were, were asked that if they wanted a, a young girl or a young boy uh, who had been left in Toronto orphaned, um, that they would have to provide food and shelter uh, and, and sometimes a stipend uh, and uh, a, uh, a, a, a commissioning sum uh, as, they, as they left their indenture at the end of four years. So you had uh, young boys going to Whitby, for example, to apprentice with blacksmiths. You had others going to uh, townships like Agila uh, to, uh, to work on farms. Uh, but in each case, those uh, responsible in Toronto made sure that there was a contract that had to be fulfilled. In other places in Canada, uh, that was not the case. And uh, these famine orphans 
uh, often ended up to be cheap labor uh, for farmers and artisans and hotel keepers uh, in various cities. Um, most of the famine migrants in Toronto uh, were moved on. <clears throat> About 2,000 kind of boomeranged back to the city to increase mostly the Catholic population. But <clears throat> the famine migrants in that era had an initial impact that was quite profound. But then uh, with the emigrant agency spreading them out through the province, uh, it, was, it became an issue uh, outside of Toronto in places like Hamilton, Niagara, Brantford, London, uh, the Holland Marsh area, uh, where uh, the famine migrants eventually settled. Many of them ended up going to the United States, either uh, via the, the corridor at uh, Windsor, Detroit, or Sandwich, as it was called uh, in those days, or uh, via the Niagara Peninsula. So what we see is that a settlement grid of the Irish that was established before the famine really wasn't significantly disrupted because of the famine. Um, migrants were on the move and those who didn't stay were moved on. And eventually uh, many of them ended up where they thought they had better opportunity in the United States. But this is a profound moment for Toronto. This is a, uh, a, a defining moment for a city uh, in, in crisis. And uh, uh, it's a story that we, we really should remember. And I think when Robert Kearns and his team erected this particular memorial in Toronto, um, it was one of those ways in which we could reflect uh, upon this story. So, that's my tale for this evening. Thank you, Professor McGowan. I, it's the one thing I wish we could do better on virtual calls is virtual applause. So I think you can imagine we are all applauding you right now. Um, and I know that there are lots of questions in the chat. Again, reminder, everyone, you can place them in that chat function. However, if we don't get to them all tonight, um, I can place a link in the chat for Professor McGowan's book, Death or Canada, um, and you can read up on more if you are interested. So I'll read the questions out just so everyone in the audience um, can hear them. The first one here is, um, how poor was our ma? Was it badly hit by the famine? That's a good question. And, and, and certainly the work of Gerald McTasney and Christine Keneally show that Armagh was, was, was affected. Um, there were several workhouses in Armagh that were very much like the other workhouses overflowing. Um, and one of the things uh, that happens is, is that you have uh, people migrating into um, the various towns and cities, so places like Newry and, and, and other places. So Armagh was affected. Um, there were counties that were less affected um, in the north, but uh, so let's say um, uh, uh, County Derry, except for uh, London Derry City um, and uh, County Antrim, but certainly uh, Armagh, uh, County Down uh, and uh, Tyrone were, were very much affected. Um, the next question, what would have motivated immigrants from Ireland in 1842 to southwestern Ontario? In, in 1842. Okay, so um, one of the things that Irish migrants were looking for was uh, an opportunity to, uh, to farm. Uh, and one of the great magnets uh, in what we now call Ontario was a million acres that the Canada Company controlled uh, in, in uh, southwestern Ontario, now called often the Huron Tract. Um, and there were townships in what would now be Perth County, um, northern Middlesex County, Huron County, uh, parts of Wellington County um, that were open up, uh, opened up for settlement. And this was well known. It was publicized in many of the papers throughout the 1840s even as early as 1842, because the Canada Company began their business in the 1820s. And it was to settle people and clear the land. Uh, and oftentimes what you had were situations where uh, a, an agricultural migrant could come in 
and actually rent to own. So you imagine in Ireland, if you had, let's say three to six acres max that you were renting each year from a landlord, and you're given the opportunity uh, to either buy outright or rent to own 50 to 100 acres. It's as if you died and gone to heaven. But of course, there's hard work uh, because if you could prove that you could clear four to five acres in a year, um, they would offer you even more land. And so um, land was a, was, a, was, a, was a great pull. I've had students work on the Huron Tract and we've discovered extraordinary Irish migration there even before the famine. So when the questioner says 1842, absolutely, um, this would have been a magnet and it's, and, it's, and it's good land. Then again, I may be biased because I was born in Huron County and, uh, and it's really rich farm country. Um, during the famine, uh, my same research team discovered that in this area, there were numerous migrants who had come uh, in 1846, 1847, 1848. Um, lots of Protestant Irish and many Catholic Irish. And, and interestingly enough, there are certain townships in the Huron Tract uh, that are more Catholic, let's say, than Protestant, like Hibbert Township, for example, uh, or Bidolph Township now famous, of course, for the Black Donnellys uh, from Tipperary, but uh, um, uh, land was a great attraction. Um, the other thing that would have been a great attraction to Irish migrants, particularly from provinces of Munster and Connacht, uh, was work on the canal systems, particularly the Welland Canal and Niagara. And we found really interesting recreations of, of Irish settlement in places like Queenston, um, well, what is now called Niagara on the Lake, um, St. Catharines, and all along the Welland Canal, where canal laborers were needed to build the, the second canal, make repairs to the first canal. And so um, there are a number of, of, of pull factors that would have brought those migrants there. What would five pounds be in today's currency? Oh, <laughs> Not to put me on the spot. Um, what I can give you is that uh, 9.5 million pounds uh, today uh, translates to 1.5 billion Canadian dollars. And that was the amount of money the British government spent on trying to relieve the famine. Um, so um, I'm going to ask the questioner to do the math. If 9.5 million pounds in in the 1840s is 1.5 billion Canadian dollars today. That'll, that'll give you at least a, a basis to do the conversion. Maybe someone can do some quick calculator work and get that in the chat for us. Um, did the USA have a quarantine station similar to Grosseal? Yeah, they, I mean, they would have had uh, quarantine stations in, uh, in various ports. But I mean, the one that becomes famous and it's post famine is Ellis Island uh, in New York, but uh, every area would have had uh, wharf areas that were, you know, designated as, as quarantine areas a and other ports in Canada had them as well. So you have Partridge Island in St. John, New Brunswick, you have Melville Island in Halifax. Um, you have Middle Island in the Miramichi, you have Deer Island in Boston. Um, so it's what they considered at the time strong preventative measures. In fact, they had wanted to create one in Kingston at Wolf Island, uh, but that didn't work out. And so the fever sheds ended up being erected at King and Emily Streets, which is really in a residential neighborhood. Not a good idea. There were lots of complaints. It's roughly the area where parts of Queen's University is today. After so many years since the famine immigration to Toronto and all the research into this event, what was one of the biggest influences of the famine immigration experience on Toronto? I think one of the great, I mean, short, and I think we have to think about short term here. I think one of the great influences of the famine was that it brought disparate communities together for a very short period of time. Um, it was a very Protestant city with about a 20% Catholic minority, but it did bring together um, Protestant and Catholic leaders uh, working together um, to ameliorate uh, a very bad situation. 
So for example, Bishop Power who dies during the famine um, is, you know, has strong and, and uh, how should we say productive relationships with uh, Edgerton Ryerson, who was a Methodist leader uh, and with John Strawn, the, the, the Anglican leader in the city, um, the mayor. Um, they all have a great respect for one another. They work together uh, in a way in which defies this idea of Toronto being the so-called Belfast of North America, at least in this particular period. So I'd say in a short, in the short term, you see a kind of cooperation among um, the Christian churches, which you don't see sometimes in other periods. It's harder to assess, I think, a long uh, term significance, uh, other than the fact that um, lessons are learned uh, in, uh, how should we say, the general hospital uh, and the way in which um, epidemics are, 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 are managed. But it's harder to assess the long term because um, had there been a very significant long term uh, effect, I think we would have been talking about this far earlier than when, you know, Robert Kearns had the, the idea for Ireland Park or when my research teams started their research in this area. It was just uh, one of those things that uh, uh, was, was unspoken. There were other events in Toronto's history that seemed to take precedence. So this is a very significant moment. And I think a very, interestingly enough, when Michael Power died, it was the largest funeral cortege that the city had seen uh, at that point. And that's for a Catholic bishop, um, which would have been considered unusual in, in, how should we say, later periods in the city when uh, sectarian tension was much, much higher. So we have some math whizzes in the chat. The five pounds would have been around $800. Very good. Kudos to them. <laughs> um, <laughs> What percentage of immigrants were actually healthy and stopped their journey in Quebec? Okay, that's a, that's a good question because immigrants of this period were on the move. So there were some that actually remained in the Quebec City area and some who remained in Montreal. I mean, uh, some of my work on the migrants from Roscommon, we found clusters in the city of Montreal. Irish migrants found Quebec rather um, hospitable in terms of the fact that here they were moving into a, a colony or a, a young province uh, of the British Empire where the Catholic religion was not only tolerated, it was actually very public, um, that the, the churches were prominent, there were processions in the street, um, and Catholics were actually in the majority. So there was a a sense religiously, there was a comfort zone in Quebec. So you had many staying in, in Quebec City, uh, in Montreal, and in some of the areas already settled by the Irish in the eastern townships or in Beauharnois, where many Irish had been working on canals, or in St. Colomben, uh, uh, north of Montreal, and then up the Ottawa Valley, where there already was a very strong pre-famine um, Irish presence. And I'm, he I'm thinking here of Renfrew County uh, and, uh, and Pontiac County uh, on the Quebec side. So, um, and it's, it's hard to parse out the numbers because we just don't have accurate enough figures. And then of course, when we do wanna count them, um, the 1851-52 census is um, terribly flawed. Uh, so, for example, we don't get good counts in certain um, uh, precincts of Montreal because those records don't survive. We have no census records for 1851 for Kingston. We have no census records uh, for 1851 for Toronto. So, I mean, it really makes sort of parsing out the numbers really, really difficult. But we do know from these individualized studies that, uh, uh, that the migrants do stick in a province in which they find friendly you know, remembering full well that uh, um, the Catholic Church, although technically emancipated in 1829 in Ireland and other parts of the United Kingdom, really didn't have much of a presence as when compared to the presence of the Catholic Church uh, in Quebec. So 
We have lots of comments in the chat. Um, a lot of folks interested in the movie. Um, a few sending the name Peggy Delaney. <laughs> um, Peggy Delaney, there was my <laughs> seniors moment. And and yeah, God rest her soul. I mean, I, I well, it's half 12 here. So <laughs> I'll, I'll we can forgive my... you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, where can we watch the movie? Where can we find the movie? That's a very good question. The movie was was uh, was made um, in two thousand. I think it was it it, it uh, was released in two thousand and eight uh, by Ballinrand Films in Canada and by Tile Films uh, in Ireland. So it was a joint Canada Ireland production. Um, there, I know that Tile Films still has copies because it played on RTE, which is Ireland's CBC. Uh, it played in Canada on CanWest Global, which I think is, is now owned by Shaw, and on Smithsonian in the United States, and on um, the History Channel in the UK. Um, but as far as I know, I don't think Ballinrand Films in Canada exists anymore, but uh, um, uh, Tile Films still does have copies in Ireland and uh, they've been more than forthcoming when I've asked for copies uh, in the past. Um, yeah, it's, it's too bad. I mean, and it, interesting, it, it, it runs under several titles, Death or Canada in Canada and in Ireland, but um, Summer of Sorrow in the UK because they didn't want to stigmatize the British role in the famine and Summer of Sorrow in the United States because Americans don't seem to be interested in any film with Canada in the in the title so it was crafted that way. Thank you. Um, what evidence do you have that the Irish preferred going to the US rather than Canada? The statistics showing decreasing numbers of Irish immigrants to Canada is a result of Canadian quotas. I think what happens is in, in um, at the end of 1847, there's a reckoning as to uh, who's going to pay for what happened in 1847 in British North America. And Lord Elgin, who is the governor general of the Canadas at that time, um, strikes a very hard bargain with the colonial office. And so the colonial office actually um, uh, reimburses uh, Canada for its expenses as it had been throughout. Um, but the provision was that Canada would now have to essentially take control uh, of its own immigration and begin uh, charging its own taxes uh, and, uh, and penalties. And when that happens, Canada, this is an interesting side of, of the famine, is that um, Canadians take more control of the emigration policy from Britain and in levying the, the heavier um, no, I don't want to say tariff, but uh, head taxes and illness taxes, um, they effectively no longer become the cheaper option for migrants. And uh, the United States becomes that option. So as you could see in that chart that I initially had presented, uh, the Canadian migration uh, figures drop quite dramatically and the American ones rise. And there's also a mystique about the United States, the kind of opportunities that are there. Um, the, the numbers of Irish who land there, you know, produce migration chains to, to various parts of Ireland. And in fact, in some cases, famine migrants do quite well in the United States. Um, we have this image of America and the famine as the gangs of New York. Um, there's a historian in the States, uh, uh, Tyler Anbinder, who's, uh, who's actually discovered the records of a savings bank in New York. And he has shown quite clearly that in supposedly impoverished assisted immigrants from Kerry in 1847 and 1848, when he looked at their deposits in the bank and the way in which their bank accounts built, that they were actually doing quite well, despite the fact that they preferred to live in Five Points, that neighborhood made famous by uh, the gangs of New York, and they had actually uh, had a greater degree of social upward mobility than what had been seen before. But so there is, and these kind of stories carry, and then more people, more people come uh, along these migration chains. Um, 
Great. Um, thank you to everyone in the chat. Hunting down the film. Apparently, some local libraries have it. Um, I'm also popping a link in the chat. Uh, Bal and Ran is still operating, and it looks like they might they might be showing it on their website. So everyone can check out the link I just uh, put in the Very chat good. there. Um, next question. Um, were Protestant and Catholic migrants received in more or less the same fashion, or was there a material difference in how aid societies treated both populations? No, in terms of Toronto, both populations were treated uh, uh, equally, and that's one of the interesting things in the Widows and Orphans Home is the way in which uh, both Catholics and Protestants who, who manage the home um, actually work out compromises. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, a teacher is hired and uh, both the Catholic clergy and the Protestant clergy work out common prayers that they both can accept that children, you know, recite in the mornings and that uh, uh, they're educated uh, equally. So there doesn't seem to be any difference in terms of the way in which you know, Protestants or Catholics are treated when they arrive in Toronto during this period. At least I haven't seen any evidence to the, to the contrary anyway. Just do a couple more questions. Um, how bad was the death toll for those who never left Ireland? Did it take many years to establish agriculture again? Um, good question, because um, even the numbers are being, you know, disputed in Ireland, but it, it's it considered that, you know, of the population sinks from about 8 million to just uh, over 5 million in this, in the decade uh, um, between the, the taking of the census in uh, 1841 and then 18, in, into the 1850s. And agriculture continues. And interestingly enough, um, old patterns of, of horticulture are resumed. Um, uh, one of the things the landlords do um, is that in the lands in which they've cleared through evictions during the famine or through assisted immigration, they've been able to consolidate many of these smaller sub-incudated plots uh, and create uh, large pasturages. Um, and because animal husbandry is more profitable. So you see a lot more animal husbandry uh, in Ireland because of the way in which the landlords have managed um, the loss of population. Um, you have, you actually have people returning, you know, returning to um, their traditional horticulture, which then in places in the provinces of Connaught, so let's say counties Mayo and Sligo, parts of Galway, um, you know, within 20 years, you have other crop failures. And, you know, in the 1880s, you know, there's yet another crisis, particularly in the west of Ireland, when the potato crop fails again. Um, in the north of Ireland, you have a much more diversified um, uh, uh, agricultural uh, the agricultural practice. So oats and wheat and barley were always sown as well as potatoes. So um, the crisis is not as acute uh, in the north, but it is in the west where the lands are more marginal uh, and, uh, and the tenants are in crisis again. And then there's talk of, of uh, mass migration out of, out of uh, the west of Ireland and uh, assisted schemes again. So um, it's as if 1847 was repeating itself in some ways 40 years later in the North. One of the things that comes out of it though, and I just wanna add this because it's, it's much more than agriculture is that um, the Irish people themselves, there are a number of responses to what happens. And um, the Catholic church, in many parts of Ireland moves in in the 1850s to, uh, and services the people who have a great sense of guilt about whether or not they were being punished providentially by this because that was a kind of a, a line that was perpetrated by some members of British society was that um, God was punishing the Irish for, for their indigence and fecklessness and, uh, and the like. But the Irish themselves I had this sense that uh, they may have been partially 
agents of their own destruction because of their lifestyle. And the Catholic Church, interestingly, in the, in the South, um, recreates the Roman Revolution. And what had been kind of a weak and flabby institutional church prior to the famine becomes a very robust ultramontane church in the post-famine period, particularly after the Synod of Thurles in 1850. And in the North, there's an interesting response as well as Presbyterianism uh, really approaches an evangelical uh, thrust. Uh, and, there's a, and there's a revival uh, in the North. So as you have this sort of Catholic revival in the South, you have a Protestant revival in the North uh, under the Reverend Cook and others. And it provides for a completely new religious dynamic in Ireland um, in the wake of the famine. Um, and there's still great work to be done on that. So I'll read, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll read one more question and apologies. I know there are some that are unanswered um, in the chat, um, but just in the interest of not keeping uh, Professor McGowan here till 1 a.m. his time, um, would you say that typhus really caused the death of the immigrants, not necessarily the famine? Yeah, actually, it's, that's a really good question because in fact, um, uh, I was going through the papers of the Archbishop of Dublin several years ago, um, uh, uh, Archbishop Murray. And uh, one of the things that he came across was that his, his priests were reporting in uh, from the Archdiocese of Dublin, um, which is fairly large. It includes uh, Dublin County, uh, parts of County Wicklow, uh, parts of County Kildare. And uh, um, he had estimated that about 70% of, of the deaths that his priests were recording uh, were more due to uh, infections and illnesses as opposed to starvation, although caused by uh, malnourished bodies. Um, on the passage over, so this is the next phase, um, passengers are supposed to be inspected in port and those who seem to be showing signs of ship's fever or any other disease aren't allowed to board the ship. So that was the case uh, for a number of ships on, that I studied coming out of Liverpool, where people boarded the ships in a frail but still healthy condition, uh, and typhus, you know, broke out on board ship because, you know, as I explained before, I mean, um, the the lice carried the typhus virus in their feces, and uh, um, weakened bodies were, were more susceptible, um, but disease killed far more many people than, than the actual hunger itself, particularly when you got out to sea, because the ones who got out to sea were either assisted or were able to provide for themselves. And of course, there were, through the Navigation Acts, there, were, there was a standard issue of food on board ship, and even the assisted migrants, for example, Dennis Mann, who, uh, people who I study, um, he actually, you know, provisioned ships with with uh, with food and necessities far beyond what the British government demanded. But still, hundreds of people died on board those ships, and they didn't die because they starved to death; they died because of ships' fever uh, and. Uh, dysentery. Uh, and uh, in some case, there, I've seen evidence of smallpox as well. Thank you. Well, that um, brings us to the end of our special lecture. Thank you so much, Professor McGowan, for being with us here tonight, for sharing your work. An even bigger thank you, considering the time difference. You are the best. Um, <laughs> and thank you, everyone who has tuned in and for your support of the Enoch Turner Schoolhouse Foundation. We hope to see you all soon. So with that, I will sign us off. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. And thank you. Thanks so very much.